Muscle Mechanics Part 2. In this part, we're going to talk about three different types of contraction, and then we're going to talk about the relationship of the tension or the force of the muscle as it changes with the length of the muscle. So let's begin with contraction. First, we're going to talk about concentric contraction. With concentric contraction, we have here the muscle, which is represented by the shape of the oval, and it's attached here to a fixed point, such as a joint. And we're going to have contractions. So during the contraction, the muscle should be moving in the direction of the white arrow. And as it does, what happens to the length? The length decreases. So during contraction, the length decreases. This is called a concentric contraction. The next type, we start with this length. And again, we want to contract the muscle. We want it to move in the direction of the white arrow. However, during this uh, contraction, what happens is the length of the muscle is actually increasing. So we call this type of contraction an eccentric contraction. The last is an iso. Iso meaning same. So what's going on here? Again, we're trying to contract, but what's going to happen to the length of the muscle? It will not increase. It will not decrease. It's going to remain the same length. Let's look at some examples. Up here at this point, let's imagine this is the shoulder. So this would be the elbow, and the arm and the hand would be down over there. This muscle that we see in the oval shape would probably be the bicep. And down here, we have a weight. And since there's a weight, there's a force of gravity pulling down it. Let's imagine this weight is very light. Let's say like about five pounds or something. And we're gonna to try to flex the arm and contract so the length of the muscle should be decreasing. So we do, it's really light, we pull it, and this is what type of contraction? This is a concentric contraction because the length of the muscle decreased. Now we're gonna start in a slightly, slightly flexed position. Again, we have our weight and it's pulling down, but instead of five pounds, let's say this time, it's about 100 pounds. And we're still gonna try to contract, we're still gonna try to flex, but it's too heavy that it drops, so the length of the muscle increases. This is called a what type of contraction? This is an eccentric contraction. If it helps you to maybe remember the difference between these words, I think of C like coming to the center, or you could take of the C and make it like an S, so think of shorter, so the length decreases. E, I think of extremities or extends, so it gets longer. The last type will be the isometric. Again, we have the bicep there, the weight pulling down, but instead of five or 100 pounds, let's say it's about 40 pounds, somewhere in the middle, we try to contract, but the length doesn't change. So that's an isometric contraction. Now let's move on to the bulk of this video and length tension relationship. Okay, so we have two types of tensions here or forces. So tension also can be interchanged with the word force. We have a passive and we have an active tension. And when we summate them or we add them together, we have the total tension. We'll be looking at this graph over here and down on the bottom of the graph, we'll have the length of the muscle. As you move towards the right, the length of the muscle increases. Over here on the y-axis, we have the tension. As you go up on the y-axis, the tension or the force increases. So we have here in blue, this line is our passive tension line. And then in red, we have our active tension line. And then in purple, we have our total passive or total tension line, which we'll be talking about each of these individually. Let's begin talking about passive tension. Passive tension, if you remember back to passive diffusion, did not involve any energy. In the cell, what is the energy molecule? The energy molecule is ATP. So passive, we don't need energy, we don't need ATP. The tension or the energy is coming from simply a recoil of the muscle. Think about a rubber band. As you're stretching the rubber band, as you're increasing the length of the rubber band, the tension increases, it starts to go up. So I didn't have a rubber band lying around, but I had a nice clean sock I just pulled out of the laundry. So as you notice, the more and more that I stretch the sock, the more tension or force that I'm generating coming back here. So as we increase the length, we get a stronger tension or force coming back, and that's what moves us up here, up this graph. Another way to look at it is I just put my hand here, and as I push my fingers down, you notice there's a certain recoiling force that brings my fingers back up into that position right there. That's the passive tension or the recoil of the muscle. Lastly here, equilibrium length. Equilibrium length is basically the length of the muscle before you start to stretch it, just right when it's relaxed. One way they say it is just imagine it's detached from its attachments, such as its bones and whatnot. So that's the equilibrium length of a muscle. 
Moving on to active tension. Active tension is a little bit more detailed, but I'll break it down for you here. Active, if you remember active transport back from chapter one, involved energy. So it involves ATP being used with the interaction of actin and myosin. Where did the ATP bind? The ATP bound to the myosin head. Go back and review the cross bridge cycle to see where ATP interacts with the myosin head. Going back to our example of the hand, you see how the fingers stretch and come back? That part is the passive tension, but then as I make the fist and come in more, that would be the active tension right there. Okay, so this was from one of our videos on the sarcomere, on the contraction. I believe it was video 2.4, you can go back and review it. And here we're looking at the interaction of myosin with actin. We're going to remove the coating right here, and you can see in blue the myosin with the head sticking off of the myosin, and then in green we have the actin, and remember what we call these black lines, these are the Z lines. So how many sarcomeres do you see here? Well, here's one sarcomere, here's two. And you remember that heads move, and you have contraction. Again, the ATP is coming into effect at the heads, it's moving them, and you have contraction. So what we're going to do is just basically zoom in here on one section of the sarcomere, and we're going to take a look at it more closely. So pulling it up here, we have the myosin, we have the heads. How many heads do you see? We have four, four, eight, and another eight. So we have a total of 16. We're going to have the interaction with the actin. So we have a strand on each side, and then we have the Z line at the end. And then we're going to have another unit on the other side as well too. So let's start off with the muscle at its greater length. So as you see here, the x-axis says muscle length. It could also say sarcomere length. We're stretched out all the way. And if you take a look, how many myosin heads do you see interacting with, that, with the actin? Well, here's one myosin head with the actin, two, three, and four. So we have here four myosin heads interacting with the actin strands when the sarcomere is at its greatest length. Now let's decrease the size of the sarcomere a little bit more. So we're coming in here on the sides a little bit more, so the sarcomere length has decreased. And now, how many myosin heads do you see interacting with the actin? Well, we had the one here from before, and then we have two, three, four. Same thing on the other side, we have the other four. And the same here, we have these four and these four. So we have all 16 myosin heads interacting. So what we do is we generate a higher tension. Think of these like arms. How many arms are holding on to the string or the strand of actin? Over here, we have four on this side, four on this side. So as they pull the actin in, as they pull it this way, we have more hands or more arms pulling. So it generates more force or more tension. As opposed to here, we only had like two arms here pulling this in. So it wasn't that much. It was a lower tension or a lower force. All right. Now, let's get another one. Again, we're getting shorter here and shorter here, so the length is decreasing. And how many myosin heads are overlapping with the actin? Let's see, one, two, three, four. Same thing here, here, and here. So again, we still have all 16. So even though the sarcomere length has decreased, we still have all 16 heads interacting. So we still have a high tension or a high force pulling in on these actin strands, decreasing the size of the sarcomere. Now this part gets a little bit tricky. Let's keep in mind that this actin strand wants to move in this direction, correct? And how many heads are interacting on that side? One, two, three, four. And then let's look up here on the other side. This wants to move in this direction, right? How many heads interacting? One, two, three, four. And this is where it gets tricky. Remember, these heads are pulling in this direction, right? And this actin strand wants to move in this direction. However, this one wants to move in that direction. So what's going on is these two heads are not going to be working because these heads want to pull this way, but this is kind of blocking it. It's in its way. This, just imagine they're extended a little bit more. So these count as well too. So we have six over here. Same thing over here, right? We have these four pulling in on these the right direction. But then we go to the other side. Remember, these four heads are wanting to pull in this direction. This wants to go that way. However, this wants to go in the opposite direction. So these two heads are blocked by the actin strand. So we only have this one over here and this. So we have six. So we have 12. So since we have 12, we have less tension than we had up here when we were at 16. So down here, we're at 12. So less tension and less force. 
Now let's close all the way. So the sarcomeres close all the way. Again, remember, these heads want to pull in this direction on this actin strand. So that's right, these four work. However, again, these heads want to pull in this direction, but this strand wants to go the other way, so these are being blocked, so it doesn't count. On the other side, these heads are pulling this way, this wants to go that way, so you think, okay, four. And then these heads are pulling this way, however, they're being blocked by the other actin strand, which wants to go in the other direction. So you would think eight, but no, it's actually not eight, because if you look, the sarcomere is closed all the way. There's no room, no more room for it to get smaller. So actually, it's zero. So that's when it's at its shortest length. And as a result, it's at its smallest tension or force. To put this all together, I just drew the sarcomeres up top, and you can see we're getting longer as we go to the right, longer sarcomere length, and each sarcomere is represented by the dot below it on its graph. Another term here is resting length. That's the length of the muscle when it generates its maximum contractile force. In other words, where you have the most overlap of myosin heads with actin. So it will be right in between in this area. That's the muscle's resting length. If we put it together with the equilibrium length, when we talked about passive tension, this is their relation graphically. And how do we derive total tension? Well, we add passive tension to active tension. What we do is we draw a line here from the x-axis to the passive tension line. Then we move it up to the active tension line, the bottom of it. And then we draw a point at the top. And we take these points, and then we connect them. And that's how we get our total tension curve. However, they usually derive this by measuring the total tension and then subtracting the passive tension from it. So again, what you do is you draw the line from the total tension to the passive tension, then you move it down to the x-axis, and you take those points, and that will give you your active tension line. One last concept to consider is that the tension of the muscle is dependent on the length of the muscle, your initial muscle length. So, for example, if a muscle is more flexible, somebody can be more flexible, can do a split, something like that, the longer the muscle is stretched, what do you think that is going to do to the passive tension curve? So this blue curve, is it going to shift it to the right or is it going to shift it to the left if somebody is more flexible? Well, think about it. The more you stretch, the further you can go. So it's going to be shifted to the right. So at a certain length, for example here, if we go up, the person who is more flexible has less recoil, less tension on the muscle than somebody who is less flexible, who is more stiff. Additionally, the longer the muscle length, the greater the total tension or the force. So if you can stretch, stretch the muscle longer, you can end up generating a greater total force. How is this important? Well, I went to the gym. I started curling about, I think it's 1,000 pounds or something like that. And when I'm sitting straight versus when I lean back, changing the initial muscle length, it generates a different force or different tension in the muscle. So what I did here is I took the vertical and the incline. And I put two lines to measure the difference of the muscle length between the two different positions. So when I'm seated up straight or vertical, I'm going to measure from this elbow point right here on both of them compared to when I'm inclined or leaning backwards. So I drew this red line so you can see like the indent right here to kind of give you sort of a length here of the muscle versus the incline. I drew this other line here in blue where you can kind of see the indent a little bit higher. So when you put the two lengths side by side, you can see the incline when you lean backwards generates a greater initial muscle length. So during the whole exercise, you can generate a greater tension or greater force, which helps you with your workouts. But obviously, don't stretch your muscle too much or you'll just rip it right out.